Okay, welcome. Thank you for inviting me, Patrick, Case, and Penny. Thank you for putting this on. I'm just going to dive right into it. And um, just need to find how this works. Forward. Right. So um, I want to talk about urban design in a very positive note. And I'm very excited about it. And I just started to look at my own second homeland in Europe, in Italy, what's happening in urban design. And I just thought I'd show you two images here, Bosco Verticale or um, the Verde number no. one in Turin, both Milan or Turin, both are inspiring projects of urban design. And I think when we look about urban design, we need to look at it positive. So another idea here, the bridge in, the garden bridge in London, just to get this sort of ball rolling. But before I start, I would love to know who in this room is not a designer? Who is not a designer? Well, that's exactly what I anticipated, and this is exactly the problem. I think in this room, half of the room should be people like mayors, stakeholders, people who actually take the information we as urban designers or architects, landscape architects design, put that further to actually design the urban spaces because we have these visions, but we, we need those people in these venues like this one. So I think it is really important for us in the future to have these people, and that starts me basically off with my project. So for me, it's a positive thing. It's a possibility of design, it's a big thing, and it's something to look forward to. So it's not impossible, and we as designers are the ones who have actually got to change. And I brought you this little quote by David Bowie, who recently died, which I thought was very interesting from the New York Times. The signature of the city changes shape and is fleshed out as more and more people commit to the streets. A magical transfer of power from the architectural to the human. And I think that's exactly what it is. The guy has traveled all over the world, and so cities, he has visited many cities. So I think our architecture needs to be more human. So what can we as designers do to entice the public about urban design in our own cities or in cities and in future developments? Well, I think we can engage the public in understanding the design language because that's often the biggest issue. Representation and visualization, oral presentation, and policy interpretation. If you show a plan to somebody who's not from the field, he may not understand it. If you show an aerial perspective, he may get a spatial arrangement, but really he doesn't get the real understanding of it. But if you show him a eye-level perspective, he does. And that shows how powerful visual tools are. So the designer skills in this case of visualization for future designs could be autographic drawings, sketches, film, oral presentations, models, workshops, charrettes, research through visualization, or the recent one, and I show you some images, 3D scanning, which could help as a tool. But this is nothing new. The Tempietto by Donato Bramante in Rome, every time I go to Rome, I go to see that. I go there before I go to the churches because it's one of the most important architectural pieces in the world. And it was in the Renaissance, so it's nothing new. If you look at Peter Cook's work, they experimented with visualization of cities. If you look at Renzo Piano's work, they experiment with, with the visualizations, like this one here at the Thames Edge in the 1980s. So, or the Germans, here uh, Bernd Niebuhr's project for the new palace, after the palace has been torn down in, in Berlin, in the city, that's his sort of experimentation. Or Renzo Piano's first image of the Potsdamer Platz. So the power of visualization is big. Talking about big architecture here, the Eugen Eagles, I'm not gonna go into the architecture, but he uses the TED Talk to communicate what we do. Or locally, the Peachland Charette with Patrick Condon, uh, James Turr, and myself working on uh, using drawing as a tool of communication. So the newest one out there is for the self-driving cars, this, they go around now scanning the cities, and that tool could be used for also generating new ideas of the city. Just this one is London, and you can see on the left and right, you can just see the fading of the gherkin downtown in, in London. So it gives you an image what's all available out there to actually, from the point of tools. The second tool is the big visualization. So these architects, 
from the States were not looking at visualizing it. They just to use this as a research project in the Bay of Tokyo for 2045, what's going to happen in the future. So they used visualization for research. And i just give you a quick anecdote. This tower here is about three times the size they were imagining it than the current highest building in the world. But then when they realized this is not going to work because just to pump the water up for the toilet flushing, they thought, OK, because the building is so high and it's in the clouds, then we're going to use the clouds to actually generate the water. So without actually doing the visualization, they couldn't have come up with these thoughts. Second thing is using algae growth, for example, to create energy. So the designer's venue, I just have to move further here, the designer's venue for communication are exhibitions, conference forums, lectures and presentation, municipality events, open houses, tours, internet, YouTube, anything. But also we need to experiment and build projects, even if they mean it's going to be challenging. So for example, MVRD comes up with these visions and then also builds them and tries it out. And without trying out and experimenting, but maybe at a human scale like they did, not like these dramatic scales. So, how can designers engage the public more about understanding future urban design challenges like climate change, resource depletion, food security, pollution, or population increase? Well, we could again use the internet, use but at the prime time, more exhibitions, more TED Talks, more case study examples. So the public needs to be really informed and involved and educated about the future of the living building challenges to accept and support the changes of urban design in cities. So what is one of the designer's main skills in this um, scenario? Well, visualization. We are strong at that. We can explore alternative forms and functions of the built environment like the city. And um, here's an example. And we can visualization can change the form and function of the built environment of cities through convincing, and this is important, through the human scale images exploring the formal and physical changes proposed. So this is again not new. They did it in the Renaissance with the idea city, two images here. And now when we do visualization, they can focus either on the landscape like this one and showing the, the, uh, the urban space and the backgrounds very just scaled, or they can show it completely, the architecture and the landscape is one image, or they can focus just on the architecture. It just shows you how powerful the tool of visualization is to bring a point across. And I think we need to really do this more. So the role of visualization is to educate, to convince, to support, to explore ideas and explain, and maybe also do research, as I explained before. So for me, visualization has to do, sort of can be obviously expressed in different forms, artistically, realistically, in realistic drawings or diagrammatic. So representation clarity is important for any kind of decision making. So here's an example by the landscape architects Gross Max, a photo collage, or Peter Latz's work from Germany, very precise, realistic drawings, how urban design a landscape could look like or James Corner's diagrammatic views of ecological systems. So very complex systems, but easy to understand for everybody. And I think that's the most important skill. If I look locally at Stormwater, I have two students currently working with me, which are trying to use the graphic tool of visualization to convince the public about what they're doing. So this is Aneshka working on North Vancouver, looking at the watershed of North Vancouver, showing all these different kinds of maps. So, and then focusing on the details of so first the city scale and then on the lot scale to explain what's possible for the people to actually integrate uh, stormwater management. So all these different kinds of tools can be used all in a diagrammatic, simple way. Or she can also explain then what's permeable and impermeable so that the people who are not engaged with these fields very much can really understand what's going on. And then, the f oh. It's gone. What happened? It's not showing, but not moving. Yeah, they're working on it. Oh, they're working on it. Right. I have the back up here so we can look at it smaller. But <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm glad. Is it working? No? Oh, one minute, right. Ah. So, um, just to go back there, so the re and then she can sh uh, Aneska is showing how that looks realistically on site. Um, the next person is uh, Sarah Badai. She worked on photoshopping the existing and then showing what uh, uh, stormwater management would look on site. So these kinds of tools are um, usable, and we're just at the beginning phase, but I think we need to really articulate more with these visualization techniques we have as designers what we can do. I myself use a lot of diagrams so to show holistic systems and explain what happens, for example, with water in a building or what happens with stormwater around the building. So I think these, as more simple, as more clear these tools are, we use in visualization as clear as people will understand it. Like this is a cross section and a plan, what could be, how stormwater could be mitigated on private land and public land. So this combination and using those tools in that sense. And then also on the larger scale, the city scale, looking at the drainage pattern, for example, of stormwater and explaining how to apply specific tools, for example, in the neighborhood or in the downtown area. So um, I'm coming to my last image, James Corner's image for the Elliott Bay, Seattle waterfront. And I find this very stimulating because it's not only beautiful, but it also really communicates the complexity of this stormwater system, but also the ecological experience you have. So the waterfront cantilevering out footpath is made out of glass, so you can actually see the salmon spawning underneath or what, what the experience with the salmon in that connection. So these kinds of diagrammatic um, images will really help to communicate what we actually do. And I often criticize that we are not really doing enough in this field, and I feel it's really important that we should do so. And concluding, I have to basically say five points. Designers need to change their visualization and communication strategies to be more accessible to the public. They need to take more risks, including the public in the process, which we don't do very often, maybe in a charrette sometimes, but not enough. We come with a proposal and say, here it is, and we need to be much more flexible to that. And then also I think, uh, climate change, food scarcity, for me, these are positive opportunities to, to improve urban design. So we need to remove the fear factor. If it is not us who is doing it, who is going to do it? And we can do that with visualization. We can actually improve that situation, I think. And then create an innovative atmosphere to actually encourage new urban design solutions with that. And finally, and I think that's the most important, also be adapt to accept change as long, and this is really my personal view, I think we should look back a bit more to Italy from the point of scale, how we do urban design. Because for me, it is a human scale issue. And visualization can really, um, and I think some of the images I showed can really show that. Thank you.